Welcome to A Breath of Fresh Air with Sandy Kay. Because it's a beautiful day. Mm-hmm. A Breath of Fresh Air. Beautiful day. Oh, baby, any day that you're gone away. It's a beautiful day. Hi, thanks for sharing your time with me today. We're still in holiday mode here at A Breath of Fresh Air, trying hard to stay off the computer and off the phone for a bit of a digital detox. I have to say it's not working out quite as well as I'd hoped. I admit I'm addicted. I hope you're faring better. Time now to introduce you to my special guest for the third of our five holiday specials. He's been on the road consistently with his band for 56 years straight, only taking a break during the pandemic. With sales of more than 100 million records and counting, 21 top 10 singles and 11 number ones, the band Chicago is hailed as one of the most important bands in music since the dawn of the rock and roll era. They're the highest charting American band in Billboard's top 125 artists of all time and the first American rock band to chart top 40 albums in six consecutive decades. Say hi to founding member Lee Lochnane, who's just completed yet another tour. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me. How's the tour been going? Uh, It's been going great. We've had a great time. Been getting great audiences. Uh, we've been previewing up until it came out, and now our single named "If This Is Goodbye" is number sixteen on the AC charts. And I just found out that the album is number five. Just a bunch of crazy kids. Look at all the things we did. Never thought it'd end like this. In the high school band Never really had a plan Made it to the promised land So here's a toast To me and you and every single show Here's a toast To living fast but always dancing slow Here's a toast To saying yes whenever I said no I want to talk to you about all that new music. You guys just have been on fire for such a long time. You can't put a foot wrong. You know what? We have been on the road every year for 55 years, including the year that everyone was off for the pandemic. How did you manage that? We worked early in February in 2020. Our last show was in Las Vegas. And then as we were about to travel to California to continue the tour, the world shut down. And uh, didn't open up again for 15 months. So that was still a year later at the end of 2021. Right. So we still work every year. Yeah, for- you snuck it in. <laughs> snuck <laughs> it in. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. 55 years. Aren't you sick of it yet? I love playing. I love playing the trumpet. I love practicing the trumpet. And I love playing for people. And as a band, we all enjoy the same thing, playing for uh, live audiences. And live audiences can't get enough of you. They can't get enough of you on stage. They can't get enough of you on record either. When did music first come into your life? Well, it entered my life when when I was uh, just figuring out what the English language was. You know, I mean, that's when music comes in. And uh, my dad was a trumpet player when he was young. And uh, he had, I never heard him play because he had stopped after he got out of the service, he never touched his horn again. But he had all of the big band records from the 40s, 30s, and 40s. And I used to listen to those all the time. And that's what got me started. When I when I started playing trumpet, I started playing along with those records. Glenn Gray and uh, Artie Shaw and Glenn Miller and Tom, Tom, uh, Tommy Dorsey, Tommy and Jimmy. Love of playing the trumpet started at such an early age, didn't it? Uh, 
uh, well, 11, if that's, if that's really early, I guess that's pretty early. And, uh, yeah, my dad asked me if I wanted to play an instrument. And at the time, I think he was just wanting me to be more of a well-rounded human being, you know, so put a little music in there. It was only a couple of years that I decided that I wanted to do it for a living, for a profession. And <laughs> when I did that, ironically, my dad tried to talk me out of it because it would be so difficult for me to make it. You know, how, how many people realistically can make it in show business? And uh, I just never looked back. When I told him I wanted to uh, be a professional musician, he started trying to talk me out of it and told me that he didn't think that there was any uh, future in that. So 55 years is doing pretty good. And before he passed, he understood that uh, we were pretty well established and oh, that's didn't even going anywhere. So did it make you a more well-rounded human being? Was he right? I don't know. I'm, you have to ask my ex-wives. I don't, I'm not sure <laughs> they would agree. <laughs> no, if they're ex-wives, they probably wouldn't. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm saying. My kids are on my side, though. Uh, yeah, well, they didn't have, well, I suppose they did have to put up with you being away on the road all the time too, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Did they handle it better than the wives did? Uh, I think maybe as it was, as they were growing up and I was gone, not so much because they were there with mom. But as they saw the documentary, the 50-year anniversary documentary, they started understanding what it is that I've been doing all my life. And uh, they had more compassion for me, I think. <laughs> and, and because they see that that if if you really enjoy doing something, you have to make sacrifices in order to pull it off. To be for you to be happy, and hopefully everyone else can be happy as well. Because I would try to bring them out on the road with me. You know, they, they came out when they were young, until they decided that they were too big to come out with me and wanted to hang around with their friends. That So right. then we were uh, separated a lot more often. Right, right. So it doesn't matter what the profession is. There, there comes a time when the kids don't want to be with their parents no matter what. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. You started with the band in 1967, and it was really special from the outset, wasn't it? It was the, the the most special thing was that we enjoyed playing music together, all of us, and that it remained together. Everyone had feelings toward music, that we wanted to move further with it. Uh, we didn't want to rest on our laurels. And back then, we didn't have lots of laurels. <laughs> too we, many we to just stand started, on. You know? <laughs> Yeah, we were playing clubs and stuff so when we had a chance to record our first album the, which became chicago authority we were still all in the of the same mindset that this is the only thing we want to do and we were moving straight ahead no matter what i guess it does help to have like-minded souls with you and everybody exactly. is ambitious as the next and it's very difficult to find that many people to be that like-minded
very first album that you had, Chicago Transit Authority, it was huge. And uh, every album of yours has yeah. been huge. But that was the that was the one that really broke through for you with, of course, Peter Cetera on vocals and bass. There's a couple of things about that that I want to bring to your attention. And that is that 55 years later, three of the original six members, that was before Cetera joined the band, we only had six guys when we started playing the clubs. We're still playing now every it's night amazing. myself jimmy panko and robert lamb so to to understand that half the band is still with us 55 years later i have to pinch myself to, yeah to, uh, you know when i remember that you've had lots of incarnations across time obviously over 55 years and you've lost members of the band too. Many diehard Chicago fans will remember that guitarist and singer-songwriter Terry Kath, who founded the band, accidentally killed himself in a mishap after a party at the age of 31 back in 1978. Terry used to play guitar and sing lead vocals on many of Chicago's early hit singles. Lee, what was Terry like? Well, the remaining four members that were with the band when Terry was with us, remember that he was sort of the leader. He would he would start off with a sort of a chum 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 getting the the rhythm together, and then he would once he got that tempo in his head, then he would count off the song and then we'd start. And at various times during uh, solo portions of of the song, he would sort of construct how the solo was going. He would be listening to the soloist and see, you know, when it reached its peak and then sort of get to the end and then he'd give a whistle, his high-pitched whistle that would go over the top of the band. It was uncanny how he could do that. And then we'd have like four bars and come in with the next part of the song, go back to the bridge or whatever. And uh, the documentary is from our beginnings right up to, I think like the 47th year. Terry gets mentioned quite a bit, in, uh, especially in the early years. And you know, when, when he left and uh, moved to the other side where we can't see him anymore, we had no idea how deep the bench was pretty, pretty much with, with our group. And uh, we have found out subsequently that we can, uh, we can make it. changes that we have made through the years have only helped the band get better at a point where it needed it and needed a little boost forward and all of these guys come in with their history of listening to our music as they were growing up and then they're able to add their personality to, to those songs. And you were responsible for bringing the brass section into the band and of course brass makes such a huge difference to a band you were hailed as being one of the most important bands in music since the dawn of the rock and roll era. And in right, part, right. that's because you brought brass into it. Yeah. Well, the brass became more of a, an integral part of the songs with us, whereas everyone else were using the brass as more of accent parts and percussive type parts. But we were bringing it in as a, as a melodic instrument. I guess, 
And uh, it was as important as as the vocals. And we would weave the brass in and out between vocals. The vocals would sing some and we'd play some lines behind it. And then we'd get our own time to come out and shine. So in, in that way, yes, I guess we changed uh, a few things. We had a different way of looking at music. Was that your doing? Jimmy Panko started writing the brass. I have written some through the years, and, and I have a, a one brass arrangement on the new album, If This Isn't Love. So that is the only song on the album that was actually recorded by the band as a rhythm section. When I said we we had our our time when we got back on the road in uh, 2021, we came early to the show one day and I handed out the charts for If This Isn't Love and the band played through it a few times. And then we had a, a basic track for the song, took it back to my studio in Arizona and uh, did the overdubs and sent the, sent the song to Canada for Neil Donnell to sing it. So he, came, he sent that back and, he, and we had a lead vocal. And uh, then we recorded the brass at my studio and sent everything to uh, Joe Thomas, the producer, and he mixed it all together. And it's turned so, out magic. It has turned out very nice, very nice. Lee Lochnane there, and we'll be back in a moment to hear him reflect further on the history of the group. This is a breath of fresh air with Sandy Kay. It's a beautiful day. Welcome back. With more than 100 million albums sold worldwide, in addition to being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the multi-Grammy award-winning band Chicago has been hailed as one of the most important bands in music since the dawn of the rock and roll era. The band's founder, trumpet player and vocalist Lee Lochnane is my special guest today and shares some of his thoughts about the band's 55-year-long journey. Lee, what difference does brass make to a sound? It it seems to me that when the brass start playing, everybody's ears prick up. It just adds a whole new dimension to the sound, doesn't it? Well, we hope that it will. That's for sure, because we wouldn't still be doing it if people didn't sort of prick up their ears and go, hey, that sounds a little bit different. Or at least they, they like it. You know, I mean, when a songwriter writes a song, he hopes that anyone else besides himself likes it as much as he does. So uh, for us to have as many songs as we do that, you know, different generations of people are enjoying, it's it's uh, really an honor for us to be able to play it for them. Has the style changed over the years? Yeah. You know, the, you've heard the style and we've outlasted a lot of the styles that have come come and gone in, in hundreds. I, I mean, when I look back at some of the names of the bands that were really big through, you know, 50 years of, of time, it's astounding to me that we were able to withstand all of that and still be here today. I'm enjoying the hell out of it, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I bet you are. Very oh, yeah. fortunate. As I was walking down the street one day Does anybody really care? So I can't 
street one day A pretty lady looked at me and said her diamond watch had stopped cold day And I said Does anybody really know what time it is? Has Chicago style had to change with the times? It appears that from that first album to this, what is now the 38th album, there's not too much difference. Yeah, I think we have always looked at music as wanting to be different from one song to the next and, and not try to repeat ourselves over and over again. And I think that's, that has kept us musically involved and excited and uh, apparently you know, the audiences enjoy the same type of, you know, change of pace from one song to the next. I know that it's great for us on stage because you don't get tired of what's coming next. The arrangements are always interesting and uh, not easy to play. So you have to keep practicing just to stay up, you know, to keep up with everybody else. Really? And you keep you keep practicing all the time? Oh, yeah. That was oh. practicing before we started the interview. What, practicing Not, doing an interview or practicing music? Well, the, the interviews, you sort of practice on the job. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. From that very first album where you had the, the biggest hits, well, they, I don't know if they were, they, they probably weren't even bigger than than what they are today. It was just that they were the, 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 the formative ones, weren't they? Well, interestingly enough, the first album, was uh, an underground success. We were very popular in America, and, and as it turns out, we were we were even more popular in Europe. But AM radio in America was not playing the songs. They weren't playing the songs that we were releasing the singles, and they told us that was because we hadn't had a hit yet. And, of course, the, you know, you say, well, how are we going to have a hit if you don't play it? It's sort of catch-22 there. Yeah. Uh, and then, so we waited, uh, we were lucky enough to record a second album, and Jimmy Panko wrote a, a long 14-minute piece called The Ballet for a Girl in the Canon, and radio became interested in uh, portions of that. Make Me Smile is the beginning section of, of the piece, and then at the end, it's a reprise of Make Me Smile. else out of the you know the 10 minutes in between <laughs> and did like three minutes of make me smile that became our first hit and another interesting fact is that the songs that we had originally released from the first album we went back and re-released uh, uh does anybody really know what time it is beginnings question 67 68 and i think i think we released that i'm a man as a, as a single as well
Olympics for some reason who are saying that we were underground and ahead of our time. And, oh my God, these guys are really good musicians and all that stuff. They had, they said once the songs became hits that we had sold out. We hadn't changed the note. Exactly the same songs. <laughs> so so I we realized pretty early on, thank, thank goodness, that these probably aren't the people that we should be listening to. We should just enjoy ourselves, enjoy what we're doing, and keep moving forward. Yeah, wise decision, I'd say. Did radio have to cut down the other songs to that three-minute timing oh, too? Yeah. The only people that were getting longer songs were the Beatles at the time. I think... Uh, that la, 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 went on for right. 10 minutes, right? Yeah, which was completely unusual at the time. That's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so how, did you, how did you react to that? Were you happy to get the airplay? Because that was all important oh, yeah. at, at that time. Right. And, and by them uh, editing that song down, we also realised that being played on the radio was an actual advertisement for the band. That's how you got the ads out and people knowing that you're you're in the business at all. Yeah, so, so you, you couldn't be without radio airplay. Nobody could make it in those days. Nobody could. And then you have to go out and play for people. They're not going to be coming to your house anytime soon. Oh, damn. I was hoping for an invite. <laughs> well, we have dinner. Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lee Nocknane, did you have a favourite song from those very early days that was your personal uh, favourite? Not really, because, you know, like I said, the, the, the uh, arrangements are pretty difficult, interesting, and, I, you know, I like the melodies, I like everything about them. Uh, but I usually say beginnings if I pick a song, because I've, I've always liked playing beginnings, so that's probably my favorite. When I'm with you, I'm with you. You don't get sick of playing those old hits? No, no. They go over every night. People want to hear them. You can, as soon as we start the intro, you can hear the reaction and, you know, the people remembering back to where they were the first time they heard it. And then from there, it's up to us to make it sound as good as they want to hear it. It's a funny thing with music, isn't it, that it takes people right back to where they were when they first heard it and they hold those memories so precious. So I would imagine that coming to your live shows these days would be those people who were there at the time of our age and, of course, a whole new generation that are just discovering Chicago for the first time. There are quite a few generations from from 10 years old. Uh, last night we played uh, in Chicago and there was people from 10 years old to 70 years old. It's it's amazing the, the amount of people and all of them are singing the songs and the lyric and uh, especially when I see the young ones who weren't obviously even born or even thought of still, you know, s- singing our lyrics and loving the music. It, it's it's uh, an honor to be able to continue to play for them. Well, I mean, Chicago is your hometown. Um, you would expect yes, a huge, the hugest reaction there. In fact, I, I believe that uh, Elmwood Park dedicated a, a road to you called Lee Lock Name Way, which is right near your yes. childhood home, yeah? yeah? I think my sister was a little bit involved in that one too. So oh, she? That's awesome. Living. Oh, yeah, she's still living on the same street. Oh, she must be so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so wonderful. So 38 albums later, you've got this what? one born for this moment. And uh, the single of This Is Goodbye has just come out recently. Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit more about this new album, Born For This Moment. Well, you know, as we were talking, we were talking about the, the differences in music and the, uh, set in our ways to do just one style. This album follows along in that 
There's, uh, you know, ballads, up-tempo tunes, Latin, uh, Brazilian. There's all, all kinds of flavors of music and tempos. And, and uh, I think when you listen to it all the way through, I think you'll enjoy it. Music heart to heart every day I breathe with just one look you set me free from all the emptiness inside of me now that I found you I can't let you go no no there's just one word that fits you head to toe baby fire from the latest album, Born for This Moment. I'm surprised that we were able to complete it because that was done in a lockdown. We were not actually able to go fly to each other, get into a studio, into the same room together and work like we normally would have. Yeah. So so it was more of a songwriter's album where they presented the song that they had envisioned with their uh, demo, I guess, and then uh, built the song from there just gradually one you know sending it to one house at a time and then we put their part on and send it back well that's an incredible feat really isn't it because you're a huge band it's different if there's three or four or maybe even five in the band but with so many and it worked out so well it is amazing to me because subsequently we went to filling out the chord more by playing different notes we would invert the chord on the double and that changed the sound again and then beyond that we started putting uh, especially for the ballads we would make it even warmer with a, a, a left and right and then a center it got really full when you play live if you overdub especially three times you have to in, in order to make it sound the same or very similar live you have to pick exactly the right notes for that chord to sound something like it did on the record usually when while you were recording a certain part a guitar part or vocal you're able to sit in the room with the vocalist and add something to it or or whatever and most of the time they were on their own doing what they felt was the best thing for the song. I, I guess the, the writers and the producer decided that to, to agree with them for the most part. They didn't change very, very much of anything as they sent the files. I've been searching and searching But the trail was turning cold Running sideways and in circles Looking for that heart Born for this moment. Stay tuned to hear more from Lee Lochnane. This is a breath of fresh air with Sandy Kay. It's a beautiful day. Thanks for hanging in with me. I hope you're enjoying picking up some insight into the incredible work of the band Chicago. 
Did you know they were formed in Chicago, Illinois in 1967? They were initially billed as the big thing before calling themselves the Chicago Transit Authority in 1968, and then they shortened the name in 1969. Founder Lee Lochnane picks up the story again by telling us how the original members met each other. Well, Terry, Walter and Danny played in a group called The Missing Links. And I used to go sit in with that band. When that band broke up and we had, I was a freshman in college then at DePaul University and Walt was going to school there. Uh, Jimmy moved in. When The Missing Links broke up, Walt wanted to form another band and the initial impetus was to go to Vegas, be a, a Vegas show band. And uh, Terry and I clicked. You know, we were always together. And uh, in fact, when we first started going on the road, each of us had to share a room with somebody else. And that was when we were staying at Holiday Inns, where you had to go outside to go to somebody else's room. You know, so no matter what the temperature was, there was no interior hallways. <laughs> and when we first got together, there was a party room and a sleep room. That's all we could afford at the time. Lee, what was it like playing with the Bee Gees? Well, we were recording an album in Florida, and they were in the studio at the same time because that was where they recorded all the time. And they asked us if we wanted to record on, um, I forget the name of the song. Ba 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 I think I've got here that it was Too Much Heaven. Too Much Heaven. That was it. that and then we asked them if they wanted to do some vocals on our son so they recorded on uh, Little Miss Lovin' I think it was. That was a lot of fun. You could see the perfection that they tried to achieve on, on their records. And when we were recording, we, they had a, a, I don't know if you know what a strobe tuner is, it's this, this huge box about this big mm-hmm. and it has uh, rotating lights and right. when, when you play a note It'll it'll stop on a on a certain note at a at a pitch, and if it's flat, it starts going one way. If it's sharp, it starts going the other way. So they were amazed that we were able to pin those things where the the wheels weren't moving at all, and uh, so they were as exacting as as we like to be. Oh, so lots of synergy between you. Yeah, and it's <laughs> you know you can be perfect and musical at the same time. A lot of people think that you know you get too perfect, it's less musical, but not so much, not really. And and, that, and that's how you and Robert and James have always been and and worked together yeah. like that, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's always worked out. I guess you'd spend more time with each other than you would with your own families. How do you? That is three- definitely. Definitely true. But I think that you know, once we go and are, uh, I, I guess, of a point where it, it this doesn't, it's not going to last forever. I mean, 55 years seems like forever anyway. Uh, and we are happy to be able to still be out here. But there is a time where I'm not so sure that we'll be getting together once we finish the career because we'll have all of a sudden we'll actually have time to spend with our families and our family, musical family, we won't be getting together anymore. But uh, I appreciate all the time that we have had. Can you see that time coming anytime soon? I, you know, not so far. I, our manager, Peter Chivarelli, is booking gigs for next year already. And you're still happy to be on the road? It's not any more taxing than it used to be? It is probably more taxing. And in, uh, the travel has always been the most difficult part of it. And uh, that remains a constant. It's hard. But uh, we put up with that to play the shows, you know, come to people, play live. We enjoy what we're doing, or uh, I don't think we would be able to because that would show up on stage as well. And everybody feels the same way? There are no dissenters in the group? 
unless they haven't told me something, I, <laughs> I believe they're, it's pretty much the same. You'd have to kind of meet it, check in with each other every so often and go, hey, are you still happy about this? You still cool with what we're doing? Not really, because not really, because we, you know, we talk to each other at the shows and uh, before and after the show. And I don't remember the last time we felt we had a bad show. I mean, some of the rooms that we play in don't sound as good as another room. Uh, so that affects how we feel about a show. But but as far as wanting to go out there and get it right every time, that hasn't changed from day one. I guess I thought you'd be here forever. Another illusion I chose to create. Putting your set list together, there are so many tunes to yeah, choose from right. every night. How do you decide that? Do you do you battle that out? Not really. No, we we uh, get together or just talk it out before we come out on the road, and we have an idea of what the set list is going to be. You know, we try to start out on a high note. In fact, th- this last couple of years, we've been starting with the first song from the first album, Introduction, because it it pretty much outlines everything that we do within one song, within about five, I think it's five, six minutes. But everything that we do as a band is within that song. And then we move on from there and try to do a cross-section of our entire career. So are there some must-haves in there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, does anybody really know what time it is? Beginnings, 25 or 64, Make Me Smile, Saturday in the Park, got to do them every night. No, the audience wouldn't like that at all, would they? They would ask why we didn't do it, that's for sure. And as it is, there are so many hits. We have like 70 hits that charted in the top 40 within, you know, throughout the years. And there's inevitably songs that people come up and ask us about, but, you know, we we can't do them all. There's no way we can stay on stage for like, you know, seven, eight hours. No, I'm sure not. And they wouldn't want to hang around either. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. What would the what would the number one song, the top song that the audience would want to hear from you in? What would that be? You know, I don't know. It's a combination of all of those. Uh, uh, if you leave me now, would come in there. Just you and me. Um, searching so long, but, you know, you pick out a lot of the ballads because those were like summer hits, and that brought not only the women in on the on the hit 
helping us make hits, but they would bring their boyfriends along, and the boyfriends would go along with the two just as long as they could be with their girls, right? <laughs> so in terms but I think they actually like the music too. Of course they do. In terms <laughs> of rehearsing, though, there were so many that you'd have to keep up with. How do you manage that? Well, we've played them so many times, except for, you know, some of the new, newer guys, and they actually practice to live performances that we've done to get their uh, facility up on the song so that by the time we hit the downbeat, they already know it, and if there's something that they mess up, they just get it, get that the next night or ask a question, and we move on. And they're able to put their personalities in to the songs that they grew up hearing themselves, and then uh, you know playing along with us. And you know they they they've actually said that they feel honored to be on the stage with us. one of those young guys that had joined the band a couple of years back now and he was definitely in that camp of, of feeling completely honoured to be part of Chicago. Well, You've had lots of different lineup changes over the years, haven't you? Have you lost count of how many times the, the band's changed? Uh, there have been uh, uh, changes through the years, but they were always they always became a necessity. Either they changed the mindset and didn't want to be on the road as much anymore, or there was another problem that came up that you know there was no choice other than to move on to someone else. It, it's not always something that we want to do. We would prefer that the band just stay together and we can go night to night performing and uh, having a good time. But it doesn't always work that way in life. No, nothing kind of works out the way you think it might, were they? Your, Not always, no. No, it certainly didn't work out the way your dad thought it might. That's right. But he was quite happy with the result. I bet he was, yeah. I'm sure. Sometimes we just have to defy our parents and go with our gut instinct, don't we? Yeah, if, if there's something that you're doing, whether it be music, podcasts, um, whatever it is, math even, if you... All of a sudden, I'm like feeling hungry. Look at your watch and no wonder I'm hungry. It's been eight hours since I started doing it. Do that because inevitably people, at least one, if not many, many people are going to say, you shouldn't be doing that all day long. Why don't, you know, the, the, there are many things that you can do with your life. Yeah, but I've chosen this one. I'm, I, you know, my, my thing is you stay with what you know, enjoy doing, because you'll never be unhappy. You know, you won't have to feel like you're going to work. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Have any of your kids followed you into the profession? They have not. They've chosen their own paths. And uh, a couple of them sing and perform, and, and uh, but not on a, a professional basis. And I bet as a dad, you've endorsed whatever their choices are, given your history. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, my dad tried to steer me in one direction, and I, he, he saw how well that works. I went my <laughs> own direction. So I pretty much let my kids do whatever they want to do. Lee Lockname from Chicago, I thank right. you so very much. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Hopefully we find you back in Australia again very soon. Like Yeah, that. it's been way, way, way too long. It has. Way too long. We haven't got any closer, but we're still here waiting. I know, I know. But that's one of the problems, but, you know, it'll work out. Fingers crossed. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much, Leigh, all the very best. 
If you'd like to know more about Chicago, check out the documentary Now More Than Ever, The History of Chicago. It's the story of the band from its inception right through to present day. And as you can imagine, it has some pretty fabulous music running through it. That brings us to the end of this week's episode. I hope you've enjoyed meeting Lee Lochnane. I know I did. Never in my wildest dreams would have I expected him to be such a regular guy, so warm and so down to earth. The countdown continues next week with my number two all-time favourite interview. I hope you're going to join me to meet Steppenwolf's John Kay. I was very lucky to get that interview. Tell you more about it next week. See you then. Bye now. Because it's a beautiful day. You've been listening to A Breath of Fresh Air with Sandy Kay. Beautiful day. Oh, baby, any day that you're gone away. It's a beautiful day.